Welcome back, everybody. This is Night Flight. I'm Judith Quoba, and I'm very tempted to say my next guest needs no introduction. <laughs> but that is a whole different show. And I will introduce him. Savan Boma is here. We have known him for quite a while with Astral Quest, with Resistance 2010. And now his website is secretenergy.com. He is one of the best spiritual teachers that we have out there, in my opinion. So, Sevan, welcome to Night Flight. Oh, my, Judith. It's uh, great to actually be here and to be broadcasting on this station. Thank you so much for you know, definitely requesting the interview, that we come together and that we build something amazing together and we share with your audience and those that will be listening to to this uh, presentation, this projection. So thank you so much for doing what you do. So Sevan, I had a question that was nagging me for quite a while. And that was in an, I will link to that video in the description box. And that was concerning um, dragging people through dimensions if that is connected to fake resurrection the entire thing that you were talking about were also about the knights templars uh, chaldean um, sorcery and so forth so mm -hmm. jump right in oh wow <laughs> well mind you that was almost a three-hour recording so i guess <laughs> yeah. the audience will have the opportunity to watch that first um, because uh, I, I guess there has to be some level of a disclaimer. Let's just remember as, as children, when we don't, we go through stages of learning. So we have something that we teach children that are, let's say, between the ages of one and five, and then we switch the curriculum, and, and then we have these groups or ranges that we teach in. And so I, I have to bring forth first to, for everyone that's listening to understand that we're going to be talking about some things that will jump around these ranges. Some stuff you may comprehend straight away and then other things you may have some level of resistance to or, or wonder if, if something like that could even be true. And that's predominantly because if we were just speaking to one group or one audience that was at a specific spiritual aptitude, it would be much easier to dial into what they need to know. Um, and so at this stage, we're going to say that this is an adept conversation that many people that are here now already have a proficient amount of their of research that they've uh, conducted on their own about spiritual existence. And now they want to know about the things that the missing pieces, the things that no one's going to talk about or are written nowhere. And that happens to be my specialty because that's really what I gravitate to the most is what is not written or what I cannot find and uh, how I can use my consciousness to find those things. And I guess the old term is Gnosticism, which is the ability to know without being told. But this stems into us just being able to dial into the frequencies that are here. And you can hear some frequencies going on in the background now. And to actually create or, or determine what kind of language is being spoken and then create a way in which you can interpret that language. So that way that the signs and the symbols and the frequencies and the lights that are, we're being exposed to in different levels every single day start explaining to us not only the story of what has always been going on, but the story of what is taking place right now. And I also will say that many are always concerned about whether this projection that we're living in is real and whether it'll just go away and, and what's happening with this. And the best thing to understand is that because of the composition or the parts that we're made out of, we're directly dialed into this frequency and this experience that we're having. This experience even continues when you sleep. Like when you sleep, actually, you do a lot of thinking, actually maybe more thinking when you're asleep than you're awake. But this broadcasting of this frequency of this awareness of where you are, you're not the only one doing it. Insects are doing it. Big giant snakes underground are doing it. Whales in the ocean are doing it. So this means 24-7 that this projection that we're looking at is always inside of multiple minds that are creating this reality around us. And also because every single day we get into a communion and a relationship, every time we take a breath, we're now in a relationship with air. And now a lot of people are also in a relationship with air and a lot of entities are also in a relationship with air. So this gives us also mediums or channels of communication uh, because many of the, the things that we're made out of exist in other things. So I use this 
blueprint, if you may, to crack some of the toughest mysteries, not just in an inquisitive standpoint. I do love that. I love to ask questions. I love to answer questions, but also to actually get into some real solutions in relation to it being 2019 and us living in a society uh, that must go beyond us looking at the TV or listening to a radio show about what we should do. Uh, and then going on to another one, which is actually a dogma, another show and listening to what you should do. And then it never actually sparking um, your consciousness in a way uh, and catalyzing you in a way to where you actually realize that it's on you this time. That if you don't do anything, it will be an infinity of doing nothing. <laughs> you will go in and out of what appears like a dream where you wake up into another life. And just like in a dream, when you are sometimes aware of your dream while you're, you're asleep, you don't actually feel like you're in a dream. You feel like you belong. You feel like you have friends there. There's things that you associate to. Some of these dreams are so strong that when you wake up, you're even surprised for a moment that it wasn't real. Sometimes you're glad it wasn't real. But just like that, every night is an example because everything here is the archetype or a template. Every night that you go to sleep is an example of the big deal or the small hand on the clock and what happens when you go to sleep per se, or what we call dying. And the same thing happens. You close your eyes and you open them again. You start experiencing another reality that you feel like that you belong to, and so the story continues. So there is absolutely no reason to be afraid of death. Uh, and there's also no reason to look at it as an end. That actually might become more scarier for people because they actually would love to have an end in a fresh new slate that's clean and to start over again. And this is kind of what's happened with the world's technologies, technology being anything external to us, that instead of dealing with some of the situations, especially the strong situations that are around our unity, instead of dealing with those situations now, we seek to retreat somewhere or find something to pacify us to not deal with that situation as if it's going to go away. But because this whole thing is a gigantic loop and everybody involved is looped and stringed together, this creates just another opportunity, I guess, for us to come back and try it again. So I'm definitely at a stage now in my adepthood to where instead of running away from Earth, like trying to find some force to come and get me, I'm more into activating that force inside of me and actually staying here to resolve a situation that I feel like I'll be dealing with as a time traveler, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime until I solve it. And that truly this must be what they call the riddle of life. And together we can solve this riddle because riddles are like puzzles and puzzles have pieces. So if each person is a word in the riddle or a piece in the puzzle, the more that we come together, we can figure out what's going on. And, uh, and so that is one of my main driving forces of eliminating any kind of barriers, let's say racial barriers. Racial is a funny word because it actually hints to shapes, as in the word racial, R-A-T-I-O, hints to shapes and measurements. And while the word racial, R-A-C-I-A-L, seems to be some kind of pun or intention towards um, racism. But truly what's being mentioned is that we come in different shapes and sizes. And that's really the beauty of the entire thing because we get a chance to see something unique through each other, another unique mirroring part of ourselves. But if that starts to become why we fight with each other or why we fight with ourselves in this case, then that's the lesson to be learned. So here we are now all in this bubble, if you may, working to realize who we are through each other. The ultimate maxim here is all is self, meaning everything is actually you. And time is how long it takes you to figure that out. Because once you figure that out, all this merges into a space that is likened unto what many people talk about when they have this near-death experience. And then they go beyond all of this and they feel this celebration and this welcoming and welcome home. And you feel like family is there and you feel comfortable there. Many people have had that experience. Most people have that experience. I can't say everyone, but most people have that type of experience. And that comes from truly, yes, on the other side of this film, we'll just call it like a film, like a layer separating you from the truth. On the other side of this film is everything that always is and ever will be. And on this side of the film, the same thing is going on, except it's in small parts. So there's absolutely no pieces that were in a space before, but are, are, that are not here now. They're just in another shape and another form. So this should encourage us because 
We're not waiting for a specific time. We're not waiting for a specific being. What we are really waiting on is what comes from within for us to activate to this awareness that I guess Tyrannosaurus is running around as a chicken. <laughs> that I, snakes do actually become birds at some point. That simple stuff that you find in what we're saying are our modern arts and our, our studies of science, et cetera, are already revealing, not in the greatest way, there's more proficient ways to see this, but they're still revealing the maximum truth about the order of what's happening here on, on earth. And also, I want to pause for just a moment to speak on words because this is important to get this out before we start. By the way, I have a diffuser going on down here, so it doesn't look like I'm on fire. Uh, that's to keep the mosquitoes away because I'm in the jungle and we cool, but we ain't that cool. Uh, a word on words very briefly and spells because it seems like that now humanity is catching on to that words are spells, words have power and all this kind of things. Watch what you say, watch what you do. But, you know, until you take this stuff inside, it's always like you're looking at it like in a laboratory floor or, or in a, a scientific uh, uh, sanctum, and you don't really know what it feels like. You're just kind of studying it. But then, no, we're living in it. So I can show you how quick word spells work um, because I think it's going a bit far for people in etymology right now. So let's take, take this word heart. Okay, now we know heart is an anagram for earth. You know, do it yourself in your mind. Heart, you move the words around, it means earth. Many you know that. So it's simple then. If I don't use my heart in some form of my communication and my connection with things, if I'm taught to just use my mind, it's useful, but if I just use my mind all the time and I never connect with my heart, what that also does is it begins to alienate me from earth because earth is the heart. Further, because earth is also the body, body is a direct template from earth also alienates me from my body so just being in a society that promotes more that i use my mind especially when communicating versus my heart when i'm communicating would automatically equal multiple levels of rejection it would be like i'm falling down a ladder first i'm rejecting earth i'm throwing trash all over the place and i don't really care what's going on i don't even like to be in nature don't like to hear nature and think it's boring and then on top of that, I would look at myself and I would put all types of trash in my body, and eat all this trash. I wouldn't even like myself when I looked in, in, in the mirror and look outside for solutions. I would look to other people and I would like imagine that I was them. And this would all come from me not communicating with my own heart. And then also, when we're communicating, we're connecting. This is energy. Okay, that's what this is all about. Everything is energy. At least they figure that out. So because of that, that means that when we're actually communicating, when we're connecting, we're also charging each other. We're literally boosting each other on these communications and connections. Many people can testify to how they felt after, you know, having a nice build or a nice connection with someone that they just met. Simon, you, yes. um, you, um, are we, are we cutting out a little bit? Yes. And, uh, okay. your internet, it says it's red now. Okay. Okay, let's do this. Let's pause because this will be easy for post-production for us to just cut this out. And let me just go to where exactly the internet is. Let me go sit on top of it and okay. then we'll continue. Okay, so, so what I'm speaking about is how we charge one another and how each of us actually function as a power source. So this is why community and tribe is so important. And if we become isolated, then we power down literally, that our consciousness is not actually capable of maintaining its high level of power. So this would be like a, a, a metaphysical depression. Some people wonder why they don't feel activated or able to do maybe these mystical things. And the truth is, is that power is tied into us activating a certain side of our consciousness that in many cases requires that we learn how to not only connect with others, but that we learn how to connect with everything. So I just wanted to begin with, the, begin with that in relation to energy and how energy works and us being the solution, because we could talk about so many different things in this conversation, but, and some can feel overwhelmed and they can even feel like there are no solutions, but we are the solution. You never know what is in a child or a baby. You just know it's something unique. Every time you see each human being born, they have a different fingerprint. The swirl on the head is different. And these are indicators of the uniqueness of the soul. And 
in the ancient times, we worked proficiently to unlock each of these students, these children coming out. We worked to unlock them so they can bring their uniqueness because really they were our ancestors returning again. And this is just a, a very simple way of understanding how this works because everybody also is here now. All the ancestors are here now uh, waiting to be awakened. And what happens with children, you know, for those who have children, they'll notice that these children oftentimes they do things that they find themselves doing. Like for me, for instance, my daughter, she lifts her leg up when she sleeps. And I do this. It's just kind of like a habit. My wife hates it. And so this is passed to her. So something as minute as me just keeping my leg up while I'm asleep is passed to someone that is, is my sibling. But how? Through what? And we know that wow, that's, that's the DNA. But we need to get a, a very strong grip on also hereditary issues, right? So you have, can have hereditary issues pass from grandmother or grandfather to you, right? And so we need to see, actually, there's more even going across than hereditary issues and little personality traits and things that are being passed. Everything is being passed. And it's just about at this point whether we want to accept or whether we've been trained how to accept everything, all of our power, rather than maybe a condensed, a very badly condensed last three to 400 years where it seems like you were more or less the villain in the story. And, and what I'm talking about is, is that it seems like everybody's culture has this thing where they are like looked down upon, oh, and you did this. <laughs> and and, it's, and we love to like blame it on other cultures, but if we start looking at every culture, it's like, well, wait a minute, everybody's culture seems to have something within the last three or 400 years where this becomes a part of like our sorrow or our feeling less than worthy. And this is perpetuated throughout the environment. And every time someone gets mad, they say, oh, you were the ones that did this. And they generalize this as if you are now a part of this nation that they actually don't even want to educate you about as far as what they really stand and exist with. So this is what I'm saying. We have to, well, we can, we don't have to do anything. We can wake up. We can access our powers, which are contained within each other. We can start connecting with each other. That's what our tribe is doing now and what we do so proficiently as much as we can. And we can start bringing in these quantum solutions because we're also very advanced beings. Like some people see nature as like a, a step back towards like a primitive time. It's just comical. Like nature's technology is so far beyond. Anybody living in nature knows the advancedness of the kind of technology that we're dealing with. And it is not trained to just reject nature as if it's something primitive. So we would tap back into these quantum technologies, which would be actually be more designed to power us, <clears throat> to give us communication and connection, which is meaning and purpose, to give us more story, to also give us real solutions. You know, we definitely can see that we need health solutions. Nature always has that. Nature is literally every single part of our body taken apart into small pieces. And so anytime that we are experiencing a problem with an acute part of our body, there's literally a part of nature that we can ingest that fixes that part. And so it's tapping into that more. The button again. <laughs> right. <sighs> <laughs> well, we've had some fun already. So yeah, we had great. some fun already. That's true. <laughs> yeah, with the recording. Okay, guys. Night flight. <laughs> Judith Boma. Sevan Boma is here and I'm very happy to have him. We had some obstacles with the recording, but I hope everything will go smoothly now. He is um, a great spiritual teacher. His website is secretenergy.com. We also had resistance2010. We had astroquest.com and um, Sevan, I give over to you. <laughs> All right, wholeness. <laughs> well, you know, just for those who are tuning in and wondering why we're so giggly, it's because we, we already did something amazing. So we're going to do it again. And, you know, and just getting in here and sharing this message, there's a lot that comes with it. And it's, it's so, it's so good to be real. You know, it's so good to be amongst those who understand what we're traversing here, like what we're looking to get accomplished with our growth and just the obstacles that we face while we're looking to do that. And uh, sometimes those obstacles are technological or with technology. And what our conversation in the beginning was centered around was just the connection that we all needed to make before starting this conversation because we can go in many directions. So we kind of gave a disclaimer about how with consciousness and let's say the aptitude of the knowledge within consciousness, that there's different levels. 
And so sometimes a person can say something that if it's not necessarily where you're at at the moment, then it could be somewhat just, you could go into a disagreement. And this is the drawback of trying to teach everyone at the same level. So we do our best, but we're also assuming today that those that are on the line have already been doing quite a bit of work on themselves and already been looking into a lot of the metaphysical knowledge that's been brought forth. And what we're looking to do today is we're looking to put some of the puzzles together. We're looking to find the pieces that are often hidden. We talked about Gnosticism as Gnosticism being a way to find out things without necessarily having to read them in a book or somebody telling you. And now we've learned that that ability is us dialing into this framework that we're in, this nature and this cosmos that has so many other ways of sending signals. It sends signals through light, through air, through gas. And that when we learn how to speak this language, then it puts us directly in front of what we need to do uh, with ourselves because it introduces us to what is missing. And so growth is important here. We want to definitely talk about solutions and how to get to the next stage. So we're going to dive into some deep wisdom, but we also want to come forth from that with solutions. We want everybody to walk away from this conversation going into action, not into more thoughts or even into dogma. And dogmas to me are when you hear something that sounds amazing, but you don't act on it, it just becomes a dogma. It becomes a way of belief. And since we're constantly challenging our beliefs, we could be behind if we're still supporting some dogma that is not serving us. And so in this world also, we bought light to words and how words, even if you add an L to word, you get world. So we bought light to that. There's awareness now that words are indeed spells and spells are very powerful and they work with, it works with the mind, it works with manifestation, but we also wanted to ground that concept in itself and ground that way of communication with ourselves and, and look deeper into what does it mean when a word is a spell. And I gave a simple example of this word heart, which is uh, anagram for our word earth. So you can do that for yourself, heart, earth, many know that already, they're connected. However, we can see how word spells would work that if we don't communicate with our heart, if we don't make emphasis to actually communicate with our heart, then what happens is we fall out of line with our connection and our communication with our planet. So this would then reflect on us actually doing things to the planet, like throwing trash all over the place or harming animals or not even being concerned about the planet, not being concerned about nature, being bored by nature, thinking nature is all redundant, thinking nature is primitive. So those kind of thoughts would come up in the mind if one was not communicating with the heart and even further that because the heart is also symbolic or the and the earth is also symbolic to the human body we would also simultaneously start this neglect within we would start to not look at ourselves as a solution we would start looking outwards for another solution we would see ourselves in the mirror feel ugly feel unimportant and this would all be because we fail to use our hearts to communicate or as a part of our communication now, I'm not downing the mind here. I'm just saying that we are multi-spectrum beings, so we have to use all of our forms of communication and balance. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because we are actually in a society that does not train us to actually use our heart and also even trains us to not use the threefold aspects of our mind, like a positive and a negative and a neutral, but more just a positive, and negative, positive, and negative. Many of us have come, become burned out with this way of thinking. And of course, positive and negative, which is just two integers, it doesn't give you a real way of examining or looking at anything. And this is because anytime we go to learn something or to explore something, we actually always plan to make mistakes first. Like in any laboratory, when we're doing tests, we actually plan on making some kind of mistake first. And those mistakes actually let us know how to calibrate the equipment and let us know what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. So we actually look forward to the mistakes. So this will be kind of contrary to the way the reality functions where every mistake seems to doom you into the abyss. We also talked about how there could be large generalizations, especially within the racial structures. Uh, this word racial right away mathematically just means a different in measurements, but we have another word racial, which actually refers to skin color and these kind of things, which is a completely false way of actually looking and deriving knowledge from anything. But that if we, are not considering that we need to use this multi-splendid, multi-level form of communication or otherwise we don't really survive. Uh, this puts us in front of just asking the question, how do we accomplish this? Because I can get on here all day and we'll talk about some nice stuff and blow your mind away with all these secrets and mysteries. But at the end, you'll be, so how do we, how do, we do this? How do I enjoy this? 
And the truth is right in front of you. First, it starts with you, of course. It starts with understanding how you need to do the action and applying this to raise your vibration to your body, but also that your brothers and your sisters, no matter what color, shape, frequency, or spectrum that they're on, are actually a part of the solution and part of the big picture and the story that you're living out. One of the big things that we made sure that we talked about in our recent conversation was to really bring light to that this is going to go on infinitely. So if you're looking for something to come from the sky or you're looking for something to come and save things, then that's not going to happen. And that you're going to continuously experience this reality over and over and over again, because what happens here is very akin to what happens every single day when you go to sleep. That true enough archetypes are all over the place. And if we want to understand the archetype of death, it is in a day you live, you have your high point, you start getting sleepy, and then you go to sleep. And in this process, you dream and you start living again. So this is no different than what happens at what people think is the end of their physical lives. They are then removed from this frequency for one moment, that's going to sleep, and then they start to become aware of something else. This is the dream. And then they start to live in that something else and forget about what they were doing before. This has happened even for many people last night. And so with this stage of awareness and armed with this stage of awareness, what we now have also is the ability to back down most fears because a lot of fears are surrounded by death. And we have also now a, something that lets us see there is a greater courage that is being demanded because I think it's a little bit more challenging to realize it's never going to end. And that possibly even ideas of death come because people get afraid of life and get afraid that life is never going to end. And we talked about even how that is even possible within matrices like the ones that we're looking at right now. And this is because we're not the only ones thinking about Earth. We're not the only ones living an experience on Earth. Uh, we have other animals that are doing that. We have other humans that are doing that. And so what this means that in everybody's image, which is everyone's imaging this and through their imagination, through everything's image, it is projecting the space that we're actually living in now, even whales, even large serpents living in the ground. So even when you fall asleep, but even though in, when you're asleep, you're actually doing more thinking than sometimes when you're awake. But even when you fall asleep, this will still remain static because there are so many beings here connected to actually keeping it together. And this brought us to also another major awareness that we're going to need some friends in this, that nothing here is really done alone, no matter how much you think it is. It is a completely false concept. Even to take a breath is already to join in with yet another being. And because breath is actually flowing through quite a few beings, then you also have access and an ability to communicate with other things that do breathe. And that's just breath. We didn't talk about water. We didn't talk about uh, cesium. We didn't talk about any of the other elements that also exist here and coexist here together. So we're also invited now into the spectrum of saying, okay, are we going to deal with this now? Or are we going to stick our heads in the sand and wait for infinity to continue? Are we going to approach each other now as feeling that we need to create a unity? Or are we going to adapt to these principles that have been learned within the last three to 400 years about just saying negative things to us, about things that we don't even actually understand if they really took place or not? And what I'm actually referring to is the real reasons behind many, many of the atrocities that are ascribed to cultures. So I noticed in my own deeper studies and inner reflections that it seemed that every culture had some type of bad story or a reason to point the finger at them and say that they're the bad ones. And then when we notice the overall play, that if everybody is doing that, that works really well for the oligarchy, that we would all become depressed and unable to work with each other. And then a part of that depression would be to get more mad at each other. So I think that in anything of this level of unity, where you have so many different parts, the last thing you would want to be is a racist or a person who doesn't like something else. But yet, we've been adapted to that. And that the judgments within our mind, the true power of the mind is actually to be able to go into any space and explore that space. But to use the mind strictly as a judgment tool, a yes or a no, has birthed quite a few atrocities and quite a bit of abuse uh, within uh, its use. So that was a quick summary of what we were talking about before we were going to begin again, which we're going to do right now. And, uh, but it's just us also saying that the reason why we're here and the reason why we're sharing is because we do feel a connection. We do feel completely in love with this experience. 
we have seen the proof of co-creation. I'm living the proof. And things do definitely get more harmonic, more balanced. Some people say get better. Absolutely, it does. But that's actually on you. And that's how you would want it to be. This is what you dialed in that somehow you would still have some kind of control over your own existence. And now because you've gotten to the age, if you may, of having to do that, needing to do that, needing to accept your responsibility, that you're no longer a seed, that you're now a bush at least. And at this point, you now have to have this maturity that gets you away from things like my God whoops your God's ass any day or that this color is better than this color or any of those kind of things and now fess up to truly what we must begin to repair, begin to put back together, uh, especially with quantum solutions. And we did give a word to quantum solutions, which, are, which is how nature works, what we're seeing in nature. Nature is not a primitive cave beast. And if you may, they always look at nature as if it's you know, going a step backwards yet. When we see even the liquids within some of these trees, even the word vegetable means stored uh, power, like a battery, saying that in every single little square inch of this, even though it looks green, it's actually all different shades of green, and there's lots of different chemicals and fluids and liquids that all make up our lineage if we're willing to share it together. And last but not least, we did also talk about how on the other side of this, it's very important, that on the other side of this, everything is completely connected. And that that's why many people, when having those near-death experiences, feel as if they're going home, feel as if they're connecting with family, because the only true family is that we're all together and we're not separated. And that we can easily enter that space once we start to reprogram our consciousness to be aware of what is the truth and deprogram ourselves from all of these lies that in evoke division and evoke separation. Now, in the division, in the separation, it does create a space that looks exactly like the one that we're in now, except things are separate. But we always must be aware that everything that we're looking for is actually still right here. And what I mean by that is that we're not actually waiting on something to show up or waiting on something to happen except for ourselves to become awake and to who we are. Because we can find, even Mr. Tyrannosaurus running around as a chicken, and we can find that still birds uh, and snakes or snakes evolve into birds, we'll find a connection with every single thing and where it's existed throughout time if we're willing to pay attention. So this is a love affair, every bit of a love affair. And we're going to talk about that deeper today and how that works in symbolism. But we've been trained to become somewhat disenchanted with our lover. Our lover is nature. It can create anything for us. But you can imagine some will take on in their masculine side. We all have it. Females have a masculine side. A disdain for someone who wants to do everything for you. Have you ever had someone that just loves you so much and cares about you so much and then you just start taking advantage of that? Just like, oh, you know, I don't want it. You even try to abuse her a little bit. Oh, you know, get out of here. You know, this is what happens. You ever, I'm sure everybody's seen a relationship where the, the, they was like the perfect guy of their dreams and then this girl was like the worst girl. And they were like, oh, if he was just mine, I would treat him so well or vice versa, right? So do all this comes from, we must be mindful of keeping the flame lit. <laughs> like we talked about this in the ancient temples, keeping the flame lit, keeping the attraction and the awareness around who we're still engaged with here and how we're engaged because that is our life force. And all being energy, that means that even communication is a form of energy. And that's why I said our solution is each other because when we're connecting with each other and we're clicking with each other, again, we get happy. Like somebody just gave us some energy and we go on with that. And that's because we're all uniquely configured like pieces in a puzzle to fit together. And the only way we're gonna know the story here, the only way we're gonna rewind before the times of Babel where the confusion started, is to actually come into awareness of who we are. And this is a good time to do that, obviously. Like, there's a time and a place for everything. We have the right channels, even this YouTube thing and a lot of this other stuff is allowing us to communicate across the world. I'm here in Costa Rica. Judith is in Germany. And, uh, but she felt a connection with exactly what was being said in a specific interview and what was happening, and she reached out. And then I made that connection because I connect with those who are just ready to receive this expansion. So that gives us a really good summary of where we were. Now we can start going into what's next. What do you think, Judith? Yes, we can. I have unmuted myself. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> and that is uh, why it took some time. Yeah, as I said, um, this particular uh, video that I have seen it multiple times now. <laughs> <clears throat> there are... Not that your other uh, interviews are boring or anything. No, they are not. 
but there are two that I have, I, I can't even count it anymore, <laughs> that many times I have listened to it. Wow. Uh, one is um, the one that I sent you, the Rainbow Temple. The Rainbow, yes. And the other one is your first, um, your first um, video on uh, AstroQuest, where okay. you go through how one and the same entity has established Multiple itself names. as the one and only God in all cultures. Right. <laughs> okay, mm. those are juicy ones. I'm definitely going to have to make sure I get those links from you because we're trying to create a best of list. I know some people may be a little bit overwhelmed with some of the content that I have because it is thousands of recordings. And I have my personal favorites also. Sometimes I feel like I just come in, dialed in, and other times I feel like that maybe I'm just infuriated by the situation. Uh, but yes, uh, the rainbowism is 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 very deep, a uh, deep message, and and AstroQuest itself as a series and Keymakers are, are very deep series, a uh, deep series. And, and as we talked about before, because it's 2019, you know, there's a time and a place again for everything, and messages always transmute and synthesize themselves. Some stuff from the past is just like too complex, and then other things it makes simple, it makes simple sense, and so it's easier to digest. And so today, it, it would be great if we can even get to a synthesis of rainbowism and, and some of those earlier Astro Crest recordings in relation to, you know, what, what, we, what people or maybe the audience is feeling like is still a mystery, is still a hazy. Because in, sitting in front of me is like sitting in front of an almanac. You know, it's the original term for what an almanac really is. And in that, I'm, I'm keeping all the annuals in my own DNA, in my own activation, because I need this stuff. You know, a lot of times there's this whole activity of where we're, I got to do this for everybody else and, and all that. And that, that works, but you'll run out of gas the moment somebody leaves a few bad comments. Like you'll run out of gas the moment they tell you on your next uh, uh, journey to your next level of awareness, there's this in-between point where you're just completely not right or wrong. You're just kind of in that in-between. So you may lose a few friends is what I'm saying. So it's very important for you also to realize why exactly you're in this. And they say that anyone that they found that had extreme experience, extreme abilities to go through not only things, but also activate certain levels of awareness within themselves. It was because they had a strong reason to live that they themselves had become so immersed in life and their willingness to never die out and never to be smothered out that they broke into something else as they break into the other side. And now all these terms, actually, we can even talk about what these terms really, really mean because there is actually nothing in the English language that doesn't connect directly back to or forward to your story. And so what we're doing is we're actually gathering all of these pieces here, gathering the pieces of your path. And I'm going to explain just very briefly why we would want to do that. And it's because if you're actually fed a culture, let's say, for instance, you're fed an ideal Right, a lot of this goes on through the movie. So we can just say that you have Barbara Streisand trying to live it out in Arnold Schwarzenegger's body on top of Nicki Minaj's lyrics, okay? And what I'm talking about is, is that how people are actually still basing themselves, which is a part of our original structural system of how we learn, is off of archetypes. So we imagine, like, and if you look at any ancient culture, are there archetypes or all different actions and things that go on in life? Like in the Hindu tradition, in the Kemetan tradition, all those original archetypes, the Neturu, and the, and the bodhisattvas, et cetera, were all actions and things that happen in life. And so life was interconnected with deity and entertainment <laughs> now because there's parades, there's all this stuff that goes on around this awareness. However, in this society where we've remixed that literally into a form of industry, which is, let's say, the modern media, this means that all of these characters that we live off of are now these modern characters. I call them the as below stars. And now... In the, people's, in the person's mind, they have chunks of data. Let's say what I feel like it's to be Arnold Schwarzenegger, to be strong, to be on the front of the magazine, to, you know, to all of these different things that I may put in my mind. And I may do that as a child is what I'm saying. And I start building up that profile. Now, the, the mages know this. The sorcerers know this. Okay, so that's why anything to do with even shamanism is always about storytelling. So storytelling is a big part of this. Hollywood is the biggest storyteller. It actually changes stories around the way they want. So what happens is, is that if we have these chunks of stories inside of us, and they have nothing even to do with our own culture and nothing even to do with our parents and our history, what we have then is we have a data set, if you may, an actual program, that's not only not ours, but it's not complete. 
because even Arnold Schwarzenegger was getting his program off of something, and Barbara Streisand was getting her program, and Nicki Minaj is getting her program off of something, and these, this has become so run down, what people are literally running on, and this is until they come into the awareness of themselves, is basically a false code that just keeps looping. And this is how it starts. This is how you can witness people. You can come back to them two years later, three years later, and they're still doing the exact same thing. The exact same person talking the exact same way. You visit me a year later and you're going to find a whole different operation going on, a totally different thing I'm talking about because I'm ever changing. I'm moving with the cosmos at the speed of the sun. But if you're in a loop, because what am I traveling through? What am I living in? I'm living in the DNA. I'm living in the memories. I'm living in the light. So when I'm doing that, I'm actually going through that as my experience and I'm projecting my experience as I'm going. So we're all doing that. But again, are we projecting this loop for ourselves to where there's not really much outside the loop? We can only repeat what the other person said. Or are we tapping into our uniqueness? And we talked about the uniqueness as a fact because everyone has a different fingerprint. Everyone has a different type of spiral on their head. And this uniqueness is actually a big key to all of this. And we talked about how your uniqueness is actually what's frowned upon in society. If you have your own little way of doing things and your own way of being, and you go into the workplace with that, they're going to be like, okay, Cindy, stop doing that. <laughs> Do it like we tell you. And if you keep exhibiting the uniqueness too much, not only does it allow people to basically find something they don't like about you, because think about what uniqueness really is. Uniqueness is what is it about you that makes you different from everybody else? But see, in a society where what's making you different from everybody else is making you an outcast, you can see how your uniqueness will promptly be hidden. You would do that even subconsciously. You would push away what it is really about you that makes you special, and then you would bring forward to feel comfortable what everybody else wants, okay? And this is how your power and your ability is actually hidden away. So all I'm doing here is I'm explaining to you step by step of how a human is deactivated from all their powers. Because you have this lineage, you have this allotment, it already belongs to you. And this is why they talk a lot in, in these texts about supplanting, a supplanter, stealing birthrights, these kind of things. Because it just basically is saying that I can, if I can convince you that you're not powerful, and you don't own everything in your projection and you're supposed to be here protecting it, then I can steal it from you. I can take it, I can do whatever I want with it. Now, I don't want people to start thinking about gold, diamond, jewels, space dust, or any of that right now. I just want you to think about your children because that's where it's all coalescing. The children, the children of the world, they're all of our children. So what I'm saying is, is that if we don't actually think the most precious thing that it should be to us, our own fruit, <laughs> And we're convinced that our own fruit should actually go off to go be study with somebody else that we don't even know, or just drop them off, that most of their time in the day should be spent away from us. Like if we actually begin to believe that, which is actually happening, then you can see with what I'm explaining, now you're letting your uniqueness, the synthesis of you, the children are the synthesis of you. They have all your hereditary buildup. They get all your traits the way you laugh, the way you smile, and they're up. then they get the other person's too, right? They may be doing something that mommy's doing and doing something that daddy's doing. So they become a sum total and a synthesis of mommy and daddy. So they have all of your DNA and that being that you made it with DNA. And then now you guys are sending your own vessel into this world, into definitely a den of lions, definitely a, a, a place where it, it, would, it would want to take possession of that. So. What I'm saying here is, is that all of what we're seeing here in the reality that we feel uncomfortable with is actually because of our actions and things that we're doing, not only personally, but also as a collective. That we also have our own magnitude, meaning that we can always say, well, I'm not doing it as bad as this other person, but we'll find, or a whole country, but we'll find that we're doing it sometimes in the degree of how much or how important we really are. So if you're, if you're the minuscule person, you don't feel important, and, but you're still the one throwing the trash, you know, you're throwing little wrappers away and stuff like that, you're still doing your little small part at keeping it the same way it is. And then if you went into a higher level, you became a Fortune 500 company owner, and now you have this factory, and this factory is dumping all this trash in the ocean. 
you're still doing it at the magnitude of the energy that you're pushing out. So this means that the true higher beings are you. You come into levels of activation and awareness of this kind of things and you go to different levels. This is a complete playing field. There's a full spectrum thing happening here. Like I said, good and bad is not the best integer to understand what to do next at times. You have to understand also this is like, um, it's a seasonal thing. This cosmos, that's why we measure time through it. There's a time and a place for everything. So even maybe you're nice right now and you don't feel like that you need to be a guardian or protect something. Then three months later, now you're a bit more stern. You feel you need to hold space and you feel like you need to stand up for what's going on. And then three months later, you feel like that you need to rest. You feel like you need to rejuvenate and you feel like you need to dial out of all of that. <laughs> you see, so there's a seasonal thing happening in our consciousness. And that's why we must be very flexible about what our consciousness and what our body, what, our, what nature and what the symbols around us are telling us. Because that means for your own unique clock, and that's why we're saying I'm generalizing still with all of this, but for your own unique clock, what you should be eating, who you should really be around, and what you should believe now, and that all of that is really up to you. And you can just take this knowledge and put it into your toolkit and say, well, I think it's time to apply this, or I think that this is more in line with what I'm experiencing now. Does that make, I'm sure that makes sense. Yeah, it certainly does. And what you described in the very beginning that you are frowned upon when you're a little bit different. In the workspace, <clears throat> I, I was quite lucky because although I was uh, wearing a uniform as a flight attendant, we had a lot of people that others would describe as a little bit freaky. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> <laughs> so there was definitely the space for, you know, you being you. It was yeah. not as rigid as other places. So that was okay. <clears throat> But even these uh, little things, I had a conversation a couple of days ago with uh, Sonia Barrett. Mm -hmm. And um, I told her that sometimes I get funny looks when I for some stupid reason i have to tell somebody yeah well you, you cannot text me i have no cell phone <laughs> <laughs> even i even i started looking at you weird for a minute like cell phone not <laughs> <laughs> and and sonia being sonia then she said yeah well i i think i should not even do that video with you <laughs> I was laughing the other day. I grabbed it. Uh, we were, they were trying to get some kind of computer device to work so they could type something into it. And it just wouldn't cut on. It wouldn't work. And I grabbed the pen and I said, should, should, I, should I try to go back manual? I mean, should we just try to write this down again? You know, so yeah, you know, sometimes things are moving too fast. And that's, um, that's a big part of this too. And I, I feel like maybe we should share and we should talk about that, about time. And, and how this really works, because as a time traveler, sure, you can speed up to the future, but some time travelers actually love to slow things down. There's two different abilities in time travel. And if you notice that now time travel has become a big part of even the conversation, Mandela effect has become a big part of the conversation. But again, it's examined like a scientist is examining something on the cold lab, laboratory floor or table it should be taken in, in the inside so we can see the true essence of what is being said. Because as a time traveler, we, we all are time travelers. We're literally caring as from our parents and their parents' parents as some total and a synthesis of what we all experienced. And, and, and the big importance of realizing that we can speed up time and also slow it down is the reality of that in this projection we're living in right now, things keep going faster. It's getting too fast. And many people are starting to account for that days go by so fast. They don't not only have time to do anything, to connect, but they just feel like they're being overwhelmed. It's like they don't go to sleep and it's, they're back up again. And now it's three months later. And I definitely could attest to when I was running my life at the speed of industry. 
like the chips get faster, the computer chips get faster, the memory gets bigger. All this is saying the same thing. People want to manifest more money, get greater projections. I, I want more power. I want to open up this and I want to explore that. And all that is all saying the same thing. It's just saying more, 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 more. And, and this is where maturity comes in. This is where adepthood comes in because we know on the other side, there's actually an unlimited amount of energy. And anybody that's even been on a psychedelic experience knows this, that it gets to a point where you're like, oh, make it stop. Oh, no, make it stop. And all the body is like, Eeeh. so this means there's a lot of energy on the other side. And the moment that you open the doors, all that energy starts flooding in. So it's really governing the energy actually and regulating it properly, which is how the body was designed govern and regulate things. Even electronic devices are mostly capacitors and resistors and things that are regulating this 20,000 volts coming off the power line because you don't actually need all of that power. So now let's think about reality once again. It's like, oh, more power. I want to become bigger. I want to become larger. Man. Ah, and then what happens with all that? Everything starts moving so fast. I believe personally, even hedron colliders are connected to this because they move at an alarming pace. And they just do that in a ring. Yeah, 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 yeah. And this would be similar to if somebody was just doing that in the bathtub. They just were doing like this and they just never stopped. And, uh, eventually the whole bathtub would start going like that. Uh, it's just kind of like a no brainer. So this go faster, 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 faster is actually a big part of what these so-called controllers, dark magicians, whatever, are getting into at this point because they want you to strip. I'm not talking about dance at the club, but it is something like that. Strip means that your chakras are also hooked to all of this. This is one big machination and your chakras are hooked to that. And so when it starts going faster and faster and faster and your vibratory frequency goes faster and faster and higher and higher, your wheels spin more and your clock spin more. And this is all great as long as it's well oiled and nothing is broke. But if something is not oiled properly and something is broke, then what happens? Even if you drop a small piece into a clock, one of those little small cogs break one spring. It not only serves to, to not let the clock right, but often that piece falls into other pieces and breaks them too. And then with your left, what you're left with is a bunch of broken pieces of the temple and now having to fabricate all the pieces again and put this tower back together. And that's actually the stage that humanity is in right now. So a big part of that is slowing it down a bit, realizing that you actually control time. And while you've learned to speed it up, you also need to realize that you are your most powerful, you're at your most powerful state when you get into the Zen, when you get into the zone, and when you're not freaking out about something. Like even if I have to prepare for these radio shows, this is years and years and years of doing radio shows. I'm on a decade now. But it used to be a wild thing when I would get on. Like I would be so like, I would have my message all in billets. I would have so much that I wanted to say. I would have rehearsed it already in my mind in the shower. And then somehow after the line didn't connect first and I started getting too hot and my water wasn't there and I figured out my thing wasn't charged, everything that I had to say was already gone. And then I was just in one of those, you know, hoping that I disintegrate in front of everybody's eyes on live TV because I had pretty much nothing else to say or to remember uh, because I was too confused inside of my mind. So that's faster, faster, faster. And that's also this perfection thing, which is a bit strange too. When we actually start getting into imagining that people who don't know anything about themselves are really good judgments of you who you don't still know who you are. And then now they're telling you who you are based on what they've observed and they have no real reference. So meaning that if we are concerned about what another person is gonna feel about us that doesn't know themselves, this is like the worst path toward folly. And that's why on the top of the temple door, meaning before you come in this temple, you need to know yourself. And some people think that, some people think that that's um, a pun toward studying the body. And it is, studying the body, metaphysics, and all those kind of things and how they connect. But Literally, there is no real external temple. It's all being said right there at the door. If you're trying to walk into an external temple, if you look up at the top and they're still telling the truth, it'll say, know yourself. And that's when you're supposed to actually walk away, not enter the temple, but walk away and go learn about yourself because you are the temple. And that's what those sayings really mean. And so now we're rebuilding those temples. We're restoring the knowledge and we're doing that within each other because there's nothing else to really build here. We're empowering each other and we're putting back or forward the pieces that are necessary for our, that our clocks got broke. Like if we have spaceships all over the place that are crash landed, missing parts, 
the best thing that we can do at this point is start figuring out whose parts. Your screen working? Good. Bring it over here. Bring some chairs from that craft over here. The chairs are still good. Everything in there is tore up. Don't know the chair. Just bring the chairs. And now we can build something that we can all fly off in because we're using all the parts that we would not be able to have anymore because they're broken. But we're gathering them from each other. We can gather them also from nature. So this is what's happening then. It's rolled out like a choose your own adventure, a real damn structure. You cannot die. But see, this is the worst thing that can happen here is you can die quote unquote. And so that's the, the biggest sadness comes from death, right? But since death is not even real, the strenuous situations that happen in the crossover points are, these aborted scenarios that happen when it's time to deliver a child are, see what I'm referring to is, is that death is the transition point. It's when you cross over the portal, the portal is the vagina. You know, hopefully the kids are out of the room. <laughs> so when we're crossing over the, the, the portal, what is that labor like? Okay. And this is what happens in our world is the only thing that a person listening to this conversation and said, make it simple for me. Doc needs to learn is get as light as possible. Meaning don't hold too much in your mind, the hatred and the fears and all these kind of things, because when it's time to cross over through the portal, you're too big. You can't get through. And this is why the laws of my act which is our mother, which is also math, will always be true because every single level of knowledge is already encoded within how we exist every single day. When a baby comes through, he's not a big ass human coming out of a womb, big ass baby with a beard. No, it's like a very small seed-like thing because the womb is small. So too, when we leave this, if we can compress everything that we're about into a small quirk, we will pass through into that next stage, no problem. But if you're too big, you're going to wait. You're actually going to get stuck. You may even get lodged in the tube, which is very uncomfortable. So everything about you may go in breach. All of what that would actually equal for the distraughtness of the child's process through the birth canal is, would be played out in life. So this is how we can read even our experience, like, how did you come in the world? I had master teachers that would sit me down and one of them, his, his gift was, is he could tell you where you had been hit. I said, what is this about? Because I was like anti-everything. So everything had to be reloaded again for me because I'd start off not believing and then you would have to explain to me what it was all about before I would accept it. And what he was explaining is, is that just like when we're coming through the womb, we also come through the stars. And that when we're coming through, we actually collide because there's no order here. There's a lot of order that's out of place. We'll hit other things. Boom! This may be the person that you hit last life, literally in the mouth with your fist. Because all these actions are done again in every single point and moment. So you may collide with something, but that may hurt your shoulder. And then you start spinning in one direction. And this controls right away whether you're more right-handed or left-handed, whether you're more feminine or masculine. And then through this process, also, as you're hurling like a falling star, you're also gathering all the space dust, which is around you, which is space dust is just basically seed germ. It's just basically elements. So you're gathering all this around you and it's coalescing around your consciousness and around your being. And so this is, this is amazing. <laughs> you know, some people like, man, this is a little bit too much for me, but this is amazing at this point for us to be able to recount now with full maturity what is the experience? See how much of an adventure it is without us making anything up. You know, we have to say that because there's a lot of folks making stuff up. They just feel like they need to make things up for this to be interesting. They need to pull some green-eyed alien out of the damn closet for it to be interesting. And it's, the truth is, is that behind even these eyes of each human being is something so incredible that it would even strike fear. Like if you, if you saw a human as they really were, it may strike fear in you if you didn't know who you really were, okay? And this is what we have to be aware of. The reason why there's so much control in this structure and this incessant thing that goes on for us not to become aware of who we truly are is because there is a fear. <laughs> you know, all of this stuff that we see going on and happening to our planet, our planet is like our mother. And so the moment that you realize that you're a guardian and that you're a child of this mother, and you awake to all the powerful stuff that you have, like your sack that you left with all of your skills and powers, abilities, what has been causing problems for your mother is afraid of you fixing that problem because it means that it's no, they no longer can perpetuate 
this system as it is. And so maybe we take a moment here and maybe we zoom into, you know, some facts, like some details, because I still feel like, you know, I'm, I'm skirting around the edges. You know, it all makes sense. But the reality is, you know, if we could zoom in a little bit more and actually say, well, what specifically? You know, maybe that will get us into a different side of the conversation today. What do you think? Yeah. And um, <clears throat> maybe you can address that, what I asked you, what you meant by ripping people through dimensions. I, 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 still, mm -hmm. <laughs> I still don't have any idea. Well, okay, so let's talk about the film. I guess that's the first place to start so everyone realizes how this exactly works. Now, as it's said in occultism, as above, so below. And the reason why that was mentioned and is mentioned so much is because it's also the way that sorcerers or dark magicians figure out how the higher things work, okay? So it's a direct reference to, hey, if we can understand any part of this, then we can see it from the entire spectrum. So now let's go to Hollywood very briefly because it, we have to bring it into something in modern times that everybody has got to understand. Now, we know that Hollywood is run by occultists. If you don't know that by now, you, you probably should give up this life and just go chill out, go relax on a tempur bed, wait till you kick off and then try to start it up again and then go at it again because you need to know where this is coming from is what I'm saying. So media is, num is the number one occultist. The TV is the black mirror, okay? It's the scrying box. So at this stage, then, let's now assume that those that are writing these scripts and working with this equipment and stuff in Hollywood are all adepts, the, the ones that especially behind the scenes. And when you accept that, then you may learn how magic works. We have to have some, some version of it working that we can draw parallels to now. We also know that Eliester Crowley, who is the OTO of the Golden Dawn, basically those who study the Dark Tantra, is was very influential in starting Hollywood and writing a lot of the scripts to do the rituals that were necessary to bring about breaking guardian bounds, like basically taking entire areas and removing the guardians from those areas so those areas can be used continuously to do things that would normally not be done in the order. So what I'm referring to here is, is that Hollywood became a place where mat dark magic could be practiced to affect the masses. But what had to be created was like a microcosmic version of how the world works, okay? And it has to be so on point, so exact. It has to be able to even affect the world of the person it's being projected to. So to be very clear, each person is a world. So to create another world and to place it inside of somebody else, in effect, allows another world to start to begin inside of them. This is what Hollywood specializes in. So now I first want to take you to the equipment because this is a cult equipment that is first to use. Now, the projector, okay? Now we've learned what projecting is. But the projector in itself, if we understand its original origin, has something in it called the film, okay? And the film is made from cellophane okay, or celluloids. In fact, film used to just be called celluloids. Pass me the celluloids, not pass me the film. And it's because in science, which is their first religion, <laughs> Zionism, Zionist, scientist, what was discovered is the film that's actually around stars, like what is the next, uh, the, the next substance that is right on stars is actually cellophane. That cellophane, or what you even call plastic, but an organic polymer, is exactly what's around stars, okay? So somebody said, well, how do they know that knowledge? Somebody said, well, they never went to space. What are you talking about? Some may get into an argument about it. But as I said, as above, so below. They examine what stars really are. What stars really are, many of them are actually mirrors of trees, okay? Especially the fixed stars. They're mirrors of trees. So when they studied trees and plants and leaves, they noticed that the leaves were mostly made of cellophane, this hyperactive polymer that reacted to UV light and actually was able to produce energy and even some kind of essence off of ultraviolet light, which is what plants do with the sun. And so it was summarized, which is also true, that the stars that you're seeing out there, the first bubble that's around them is cellophane. Okay, now I'm just bringing this to your attention because now then, with this material cellophane, it makes sense then that if that is our strip of film, 
and we put these stars in the negative because remember these are also called negatives so we put these stars like john wayne and marilyn monroe onto this strip of cellophane and we then project with light this through a cathode ray tube which is shaped like a hexagram into the person's mind that's actually watching this using a thousand points of light that's an angelic reference millions of points of light then in effect we can actually send an entire world into their mind okay so when i say the film anytime in this conversation you should understand that what i'm referring to is is that it's an actual layer that starts to become created that se separates you from what's really going on now this was also taken from because remember this is not their invention this was taken from that nature does this also it's like her way of kind of soothing her children she puts a film over their eyes to kind of shield them from darker things that happened at a certain time so i'm going to explain this when you die if you haven't made the breakthrough yet and you haven't like knocked down the tunnel to yourself there are all these doors films if you may that are separating you from the past life and every time you die that film is that door is closed and there's like a film or a separation that's between you and the last life and it's hard to either get through that film see through that film that's why you don't know much about your past life it's hard to break through that film okay so this is what i mean by when someone can be dragged through worlds is that every time something stops and begins and there's a film in between it this basically makes it like a separation for a person now i'm going to make it very even more clear especially for those who like symbolism if you notice when you look at a shell a shell in the ocean the ones that spiral and fly there are these little parts in each little separations in each part it's like where the calcium builds up forms a wall and the wall becomes the structure that builds the next case okay and that's why a shell generally has these separations in it and you can't put your hand all the way through it because it actually has like little films that separate it so when they call it a breakthrough what they're referring to is somehow you gain the ability to knock down all of those doors down the tunnel of five back to your original origins to the original awareness of yourself and you're able to connect your end to your beginning your alpha to your omega at that point you become hyper sentient and until then you exist with these films or layers blocking you from the past life and blocking you from the awareness of what happens after death and what happened to grandma what happened to grandpa what happened to great great grandma what happened to your son what happened to your dog that that place that they are is on the other side of the film, okay? We call it outside of time, okay? So what Hollywood has done is Hollywood has created a lot of film. Now, how you know this is phi is because now look at a film strip. Now, a film strip is exactly identical to the flat earth model. It is exactly how a projection really is. It's a disc. And the main thing to realize here is that if we took that one piece of film, which is like tape from a Hollywood strip, and then we just threw the reel, how long is that film? Super long. You ever un even a tape deck, have you ever unraveled all the tape? You're just unraveling all the tape? You ever done that? It's fun, right? But what is that tape actually made out of? What's, how is that memory being stored on that tape? Through magnets. Right, that somehow this film and these magnets is storing memory. Where are they getting this stuff from? You think they're inventing this stuff? They're thieves. They don't invent anything. They're not original. That's why they're dying because they're not original. Any being that only things that die are things that are not original. Anything that is original will exist forever. So they're in the world of death because they are refusing to accept certain levels of knowledge. They're aware of how it works, but they don't want to accept that. So what I'm getting at here is, is that that reel that you're looking at, look what they call it, real. This is what I'm saying about etymology. It could be simple etymology, it could be complex etymology. But now you got this reel with these stars on it and this film in negative. And it's all phi because it's a spiral. And now the entire life or the entire movie is wound up on this reel and it's just waiting to get played 
so that it can be projected into another being's consciousness. And when we realize again that these are the deepest levels of magic, you know, you may just see this as like, well, that's just technology. No, this is how magic really works. And this is how worlds are projected into a person's mind. So then we go further and we find that there's a story that continuously be that is continuously retold over and over again in the movies that you love. Now there's fill-ins, movies that you may not feel that that was the greatest movie, but there's these movies that you really love. And they wrote a book one time and it was it was called um geez, it's about every it's about the necessary characters that have to be in a story. So just as I told you before about sorcery and those kind of things, really storytelling, there's necessary characters that have to be there. And you've seen that in some of the lineups of Disney's, you know, the grumpy one, the the antagonist, the protagonist. So these characters, as long as that they're included in the story, it makes it a good movie. And where this knowledge is founded on is actually founded on astronomy or the stars, the house of cards, to where if you can get the major arcana all playing in a role together, then you can create theatrics. So this is where all of this really comes from, but it's taken directly from nature. It's taken directly from our mother. And it's not only just taken, it's then used to psychologically manipulate us, to suggest things that we may not understand completely how it connects to us. Like for instance, in Sesame Street, there is a character that each child really feels that they're more like. So a child can walk away from Sesame Street from the first time feeling like they're more of an Oscar the Grouch. Okay? And then from there, if they have been able to dial in, this is William Want, this is uh, uh, John Trump, this is uh, 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 many of the people who developed the school systems that we're working in now. That child can walk away with feeling like that they are not only an Oscar the Grouch, Now in the next movie that is made, that is working with this same template, there is now a new Oscar the Grouch. He's not going to be called Oscar the Grouch, but he's going to serve the exact same role as Oscar the Grouch did in Sesame Street. And now the kid is going to watch that new movie and he's going to identify with this character. Now this is a process. That's what I'm saying. This is not happening just in one movie. Because it may be 10 or 15 years down the road when just like Avengers Endgame, they just kill all the characters. You see what I mean? Because they will run that character through all these different cycles that they need this character to truly perform. So let's say, for instance, there's this character that is hyper intelligent, that is more like a nerd, gets bullied around, but actually ends up developing something that changes technology and the face of technology in every way that it should be. And then somehow he also ends up becoming a villain towards the end. So that same kid that felt like they gravitated towards that nerdiness and creating things, but children making fun of them until all the way to a point where they develop something. Now that may be George Bezos now, owner of Amazon. And what happens is, is how they always maintain control is Oscar the Grouch has a handler, if you may. There is a psychological subset around Oscar the Grouch. And as this character is continuously being manipulated, it's almost like an AI is watching all this now, but it's like pieces are being moved around the puzzle without even the characters knowing that they're actually in play, that they, this is all going on. So this means that a script will run out inside of each person and they will act into the role of a character and never realize that they're playing themselves inside of a movie that is actually being suggested and, and suggested to them psychologically. And this goes on for 50 to 60 years as a person is manipulated within just archetypes that they gravitated to as a child. So again, there's a lot to expunge from that. There is a metaphysical awareness of how exactly how things work and how programming can work even now in modern technology. There's awareness that many people that are actually inside of these structures, meaning stars and actors are completely under control and are actually being handled and carrying out roles that they don't actually know the complete meanings to, that they, not that they even care. And that this stuff is broadcasting night and day to a point where things are changing. One of my recent recordings was about Netflix's, you may have to watch what you say even on these lines, but I guess I'll just use the, the, it's the pedo word. See, we have to watch what words that we use now, especially on YouTube if we plan to stay. That's why I'm planning to leave because once they pick up that word, then they're already like trying to use their algorithms to determine if they should be removing your channel. But there's a lot of abuse towards children, let's just say that. And in this abuse towards children, this is perpetuated inside of the movies a lot now, especially Netflix. Netflix seems to be a storehouse for this abuse towards children now. 
And all the new movies seem to refer to actual sexual relationships with children as they're underage. Now, this is coming out. And it's so blatant that you wonder why these people don't just go to jail. I mean, this can't even be legal at this point. 20 years ago, everybody in there would be going to jail. But now it's okay. And it's because it's a slippery slope of psychology. Let me show you how this would work. Because this is more psychological than it is metaphysical. If I say we got Spacey, we got Kevin Spacey, we got Bill Cosby, and we got Weinstein. Somehow, people think that, okay, all the abusers, all the sexual child predators and abusers in the world, we got them. We got Osama bin Laden too. And this is how these programs actually work. Because remember, the person's only working with, like we talked about earlier, they're only working with a limited film strip of characters that are not even real. So they actually believe, a lot of the conscious consensus, the hive, if you may, believes that all the rapists are now captured or being punished because they also got R. Kelly. They got R. Kelly too. <laughs> and this is like six men. Half of them have already gotten away but have nothing really to do with the overall, well, they have something to do with, but they have, they're not, the, they're not the big picture of the whole thing is what I'm saying. But now, then, let me show you then what happens. This is how it all works through suggestion of psychology. Now, since these guys are in jail, now Netflix is making these new movies where right away the children are being casted in these very ultra-sexual roles and the child is only like 12. But psychologically, in the person's mind, who's already been brainwashed by the last program that they just sent out across the media, they say, well, you know what? I know nothing could be happening with those children. They even say this subconsciously. They never think about this in their conscious mind anymore. They say subconsciously to themselves because the subconscious mind picks it all up. Like, wait a minute, are they talking about having sex with children? The subconscious mind immediately says, no, because obviously right now, if somebody was doing that even in Hollywood, somebody would be watching or policing that because everybody out there is under fire right now. And if there was any kind of sexual abuse going on, it definitely wouldn't be happening now because nobody wants to lose their job in Hollywood. What? But this is how the thought process is being morphed. So what I'm asking is, what are we in for next? With it now being okay, like rap music, it's just ridiculous. Like this is disgraceful to the culture. I don't care what anybody is saying. It's like, for us to share the same skin color and for you to be talking and saying these kind of things, especially about other people that are involved in our same racial group, you got it. We need to oust you. But somehow this is the most popular thing, right? And, but it still perpetuates this idea and these stereotypes of what it's like to be in this skin color, which is most of the time false. And then again, so, and everybody gets it. Like I say, everybody's got something. Like even if we throw in Germany, oh, Germany, all oh, the Nazis, all oh, that, that has nothing to do. The German people are still dealing with the poverty situation from that shady ass treaty that was signed when Hitler was acting like Osama bin Laden back in his day, just trying to deal with maintaining things before the bunker busters come and take up everything because they can't put their damn bank in. And, and it's as simple as that. But this force that continuously erects more and more protection around itself, oh, you must protect our community, you must protect our symbols, you must protect. And this is what is leading further and further into when this closes, it'll be like a film. It'll be, they'll cast it just like a movie role. It'll have a grand consendo, maybe a World War III. And then, you know, it'll all file out and it'll feel like it was everybody's fault and then we'll loop again. And I believe at this point that this has happened so many times, not only am I getting sick of it, it's making me wake up a lot earlier than even I should. It's like, yo, wake up, man, wake up. Because it's going to loop again. It's going to loop again. You can feel it because what change did we actually make? Where are we really, what, what actions are we actually making to change this? And is there something that we can actually do? We thought that our voice was going to be enough, that just getting onto these microphones and, and actually making people aware of consciousness was enough. I've been doing this 10 years to only find out that I actually have 10 years, 100,000 subscribers. So this is mean to be I was like the slowest growing YouTube channel then. This means I accumulate only 10,000 subscribers per year on this channel, right? So what happens here is, is that we can now get into the solutions. I'm gonna get you right into the solutions so we can assess the power here because we need power. You're powerless now, you're not sovereign anymore. You're not a sovereign operating on the land anymore. Your nobility was stolen. This even happened rather recently. Like they show that all the treaties were changed. A lot of the people that had land and all that don't have it anymore. All that's been going on right underneath our nose. So I'm gonna explain to you the key. I'm gonna give you two keys. They say there's only three. 
I'm going to give you two of them now. You should be able to unlock the rest of them yourself. And that way, this just doesn't become entertainment for you. First key, Venus. Okay? I don't know how we missed it. <laughs> That's why, you know, you're supposed to get knowledge also. Even if you're on the correct path, you get knowledge when it's time for you to get that knowledge. You could rush it all you want, and it just won't make any sense. Somebody could be telling you directly. But until it's your time, it won't make any sense. Let me show you something. Now, if you Google ancient Venus statue right now, you will find some statues pulled up in Europe. You know, so you can't make this a racial thing. You can't say, well, these, these come from Africa. So, of course, they're going to be making these statues with big, giant breasts and big booties. And, like, Africans are the only one with big breasts and big booties. Where does that come from? So, anyway... So you see these statues of actually not even a black or a white person, to be honest, but more of a reptilian in the face with a mammal body. And this is several of the statues. This is not just the one that they cooked up in the last ancient aliens. They made him in the back room. <laughs> I'm talking about the real ones that they keep unearthing and have been unearthing for a long time of, because they were used as fertility symbols. I mean, shit, if the entire planet means fertility, then it, it makes sense to kind of make a symbol of it and just say that this is fertility. It's like a way of using emojis. Some people say, oh, they were worshiping idols, but you're using emojis. It's a way of using emojis. We use a symbol like a, this big, these big breasts, this big booty, this big stomach. This is, a, this is fertility for us. And for a human being, that would be where it is because that's how children get fed and that's how you can maybe even fit more than one child inside the womb. And that's how you can actually fit maybe a hundred children through these wounds. Because if you actually look in the old days, women were actually having a lot more children than they used to, not even the nine or 10. Some people have even ancient older families out. There's 20 of us, and that sounds incredible, but 50. They have a woman even on record now that has 100 children, okay? So let's just take this from where we, what we really know is going on. I'm going to show you how things get screwed up. Now, Venus then, as you keep following her through history, and she's very important, the reason why you know she's important, first of all, Venus is the pentagram, okay? We know that Venus traces out a concave pentagram in the night sky. Go look it up yourself. Over an eight-year period, Venus traces out a symbol that is a perfect pentagram, except for the sides are round, which is something else to pay attention to. But these yeah. angles on Venus, like a flower, she's tracing this in the night sky. So there is absolutely nothing else inside the cosmos, outside the cosmos, in the planet, outside the planet, that could be more mystical than a planet that is actually tracing out a symbol in the sky over a period of time. Now, of course, you're not going to see it in one night. And that's why it's important to be learned and to be wise, because you have to watch things over time in order to learn their true nature. And sure enough, after eight years, as the Mayans quickly figured out and many other cultures figured out, that this thing traces out the same symbol that is found within most of the vegetation. Okay, almost to suggest that the vegetation came from there. So let's keep going on with it. So now we're into this notion that it's possible that this symbol actually somehow connects to the abundance and the vegetation and the population, maybe even of this planet that we're calling Earth, which we'll have to get back to later on. Because who even told us we were on Earth? But anyway, so now when we see Venus, we now see Venus as this pentagram. And the only thing that I want to bring light to is how this metamorphosis starts to take place to show you how a symbol is demonized, how abundance becomes death, and even some cold, dark vampire. So as it keeps going, Venus ceases to become this very voluptuous creative force, which actually doesn't even fit the male sexual psyche at this point, to be honest. Like when you look at those old statues of Venus, this is not a trimmed down chick from Victoria's Secrets. Okay. So it doesn't actually fit this model in the mind that modern men have been trained to feel like is beautiful. Okay. And this is why when you go in Africa, they actually find heavyset women more beautiful. Ask them about that. It's like, yo, brother, is a shorty over there. Though. She's like a Coke bottle. Oh, no, brother. She's like a stick. This one I want, and it's like, but Mbutu, why? He'll be like, because she's abundant. She will have children. My children will be fat. We will all be healthy. So it's kind of like the same concept that came with the Buddha statues, that having a lot of weight meant that you were wealthy and you were abundant. And that's how people connected it. Because if you were starving back in the day, then a lot of other things you would be subject to. You wouldn't have the strength that you needed to endure. So sim the symbolism of fertility, love, connection abundance was a heavy set woman okay so now let's take it from there the same venus now then in the next text over gets a slight name change because spanish belonged to the moors 
where we get our word amor from, which means Venus. It's a Spanish word meaning love. And this is because the symbol we have for love, which is a heart, when you break those two and a half, they're two five. Right? They're two fives. Now, these two fives, when, you, when they're separated, is called a broken heart. <laughs> a broken heart. Because this is a reference to that. If you don't know about your other half, literally, it's called your other half, and you're separated from your other half, like literally on the other side of the film is your other half, then you're heartbroken. Okay? You never feel like you, you're in love. You don't know your connection. You don't know what's going on. This is where all this symbolism comes from. So we find it interesting then that Venus, she gets her first makeover, okay? Because this ideal of this voluptuous thick woman is too much for everybody and too much into the ideals of where they want to take, too much uh, into the ideals of where they want to take things from. So she gets a facelift. Now she's got red hair. Her sex is on fire now. She's coming out of a clamshell. She's lost about at least four dress sizes. At least she's like a one at this point. And she looks nothing like the original. And this is what I was saying before about a simple question to ask yourself. If you create a truth on top of a lie, is this still the truth? I ask once again, if you create a truth on top of a lie, is it still the truth? Some people will wrestle with this. They'll say, well, whatever I feel like my truth is inside. No, 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 not neophyte, adept. If you create what you feel like is a truth on top of something false, it is false. And this is why it was always known that man's knowledge, what we had cooked up now, was foolishness to the higher beings because its initial root was on falsehood. And so if our ideals of Venus are not locked into the original symbolism, we'll lose the whole story. We'll lose what Phi really is, how the bodies were really created, where the plants really came from, what is the whole story with the divine feminine, where, why is she called, why is she a suitor? She's called the suitor. She's called often a whore. And this was, a this, was, this was a reference to that she had many partners, not that she was a stripper on the streets, that she could have lions, she could have donkeys, she could have plants, she could have humans. She was not limited to just having a partner out of just one specific kind of being, that she could have partners from everything. They called her the mother of monsters, meaning that in the beginning, the first form she birthed were as large as planets and they were fearsome. Imagine like cross between whales slash this slash that. And this was the beings that are coming forth. And we're calling those beings planets right now. We're on one of them, one of her children. Okay. So to explain this a little bit more, because some people say, well, maybe he's just a Venus lover. I'm going to show you how it all works. As the facelift happens, Venus again, she comes down a few sizes and now she's all slim and now she's incorporated into the romantic theism. Okay, now we're living in a Roman society now where everything is romanticized so you can smile now and cry later. So now she's romanticized and now she's taken into this, she's taken off as this frail. Now she's frail. This is the main thing. She's frail, she's defenseless. And in most statues that are cognates of Venus, the arms are broke off. And they always tell you, oh, no, the, the sculpture is so old. The arms just fell off. But then they got another sculpture right next to it that is a thousand more years older and the arms are still on it, but it's Hercules. <laughs> the arms are broke off because this is all symbolic. They're actually continuously telling the story, even up until this very point, to keep the divine feminine suppressed for the main reason. Because for males, if they get to the woman, they get to you. They've already gotten to you. You're done. That's the same. That's the womb you got to come out of. So if they get to the womb or the portal, they, you're already compromised. So that's why, if you want to know why is it always about the woman and blah, blah, blah. Duh, you, you, you need the portal. You need the shift to get into reality after reality. Nothing is lying to you here. That is the same way you got here. So there's nothing more to believe. Some will try to search for other stories and other things to believe. And we'll be on shaky ground because none of that will be able to be verifiable. But when we look at what is verifiable, we find that our mother is then restylized as a frail being with no arms that needs the help of Hercules. Hercules, come save me. Right? So now, 
because also remember all of this also is modeled and this is where my studies have taken me with in relation to venus uh is not only very serpentine and saturn itself being more lion-like that both of these blended together early in the game before we even start telling all these story, stories so you're actually dealing with more of like a serpent lion so if you want to understand the, ideo the ideologies and the way in which this, this original state functioned, the women were the ones doing the hunting. The women were the ones that were actually building up most of the structure. It's the same thing as what you see with the lions now. When a lion, the female, does all the hunting. See, the biggest riddle here, they call it the mystery of the sphinx. The mystery of the sphinx, that riddle is cracked because that is not only uh, a, 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 what some would say is a... a I use the right term here, Alki Bulan, which is the name of the territory, a Kemetan woman. Not only a Kemetan. See, they thought it was a Kemetan man. They thought it was a black man. They thought it was a black man, so they broke off his nose. Napoleon broke off his nose. The high from reality was black. No, that's, that's not the whole of it. It was a black woman. Dark skinned Naga, meaning that Nagas and Dravidians connect black people and Germanic people and white people and all those different colors. They all connect them all in one race. The Dravidians or Dravid or David which is a symbol of a hex, uh, two triangles interlacing each other, connect both races. That's what this is saying. They got this six ether hair, which is the long hair, the silky hair, right? But they got this dark skin, right? And some of them have blue eyes, some have dark eyes. So basically it's saying within all races, this, this is the mother of all races. So that's the mystery. That's why I say the mystery of the riddle, if you never crack the riddle of the Sphinx, you can never get out. And it's a real thing they're talking about because if you don't know where the womb is, you can never get in and out. If you don't remember where your mother is, you can't get in or out anymore. So you become stuck. So let's keep going with this. So we find Venus gets another makeover. And this is why you know there's a lot in the Bible that's false and a lot that's just been written because there's a literal text, okay? Venus gets a name change also. She comes over into the Moorish term, Lucifer, okay? And the reason is because this term actually means carrying light. That's why they call it the light bearer. Lucifer, Lou, the cipher, the cipher of Lou, Lou, loose, light, the cipher of light, the encodings of light, the encryptions of light, something that's carrying the coding and encryptions of light. That's how you decipher Lucifer and what the word means. So, but what does that mean? How do you carry the codes and the encryptions of light? How do you carry in a bag what binds flesh to spirit? Right? I got the Sumerian guy out there holding the bag, but that's not the one. You got to secure the bag from him. It's a reference to a woman carrying the seeds of life the dna the dna is a language or a word and a vibration that binds our souls back into fleshly bodies this is not light technology you're not going to build this in your garage okay so this word lucifer is only a reference to a being that is capable of doing that because it still is a reference to venus right because remember lucifer is venus go check your dictionary but notice the play here and this is how you'll know because their fingerprints are all over the place. It's disgusting. So the moment that you know what's happening, you'll see it everywhere. It says Lucifer. Oh, perfect one, son of the morning, blah, blah, blah. How I find fault in you. Yes, you were beautiful amongst all the stars and blah, blah, but now I'm going to cast you down. And now I'm going to step on you. And now I'm going to be, and you're going to be like Satan. See, now, the reason why this is buffoonery in metaphysics is because in metaphysics and ancient knowledge, Lucifer is not Satan. <laughs> Venus is not Saturn. They have a relationship, though, and this is how the depths are working, with these, these dark sources are working with this because they're basically casting out Venus and Saturn, right? But I'm going to show you how this all rolls out, and this will be the sum total of today's conversation because it is the key to everything. It'll make you really think about everything, and it'll start asking you, well, what other stuff are they doing that to? Are they doing that to me? Are they making me believe that I hate this person, really, and I really don't? Absolutely. They can work your mind in all types of ways if you don't have it in control. So watch how this play goes out. I'm showing you. So now Venus is literally transformed into not only a genderless angel. So remember, this is a process happening over time. So now she's, Venus is now this angel morning star thing that has angels are genderless, according to the text. They don't have a vagina or a penis, or they have both. This is either one or the other. And actually, it's a reference to that. Actually, Venus is an angel. She is a hermaphrodite. She does have both. She is a parthenogenic. 
which means that the original females can birth from themselves. I'm like, hey, newsflash, guys, not necessarily needed. Just like in the serpent, in the serpent genus, many of the serpents are parthenogenic. And that means that the female actually functions as a male. Occupuses are even more weird. Some fish are even more weirder. Fish, some fish can change from being males to females. Did you know that? So, you know, there's no limitations here in nature is what I'm saying. But this is a reference. But notice how this plays out in the human psyche. So the human psyche now thinks that it's what we're referring to is this dark angel that now looks like a devil with horns in the mind's eye. Was once perfect, but now because God got pissed off and jealous with it, this masculine God, he's thrown it down onto earth and into hell and now it's become Satan. and this is like a hodgepodge because sat or satun was originally in the Kemetan text as a destroyer it functions as he functioned as the same component as shiva did in the hindu tradition which is when there's when it's time for something to go and there's always a time for something to go in the death rebirth and a regeneration cycle Sat is responsible for removing that. That's why Sat was known as the Grim Reaper, the one who reaps, the one who basically, like a gardener, pulls up fruits that are now doubly dead and now need to be regenerated. And that was Sat's purpose. So he's trying to make a whole story out of Sat that he basically one day did that. He killed something without order over a chick. This is literally what this, this new modern text say is that Sat, because of his love for Osiris, and Neftis killed Osiris to hook back up with Isis and Neftis. And he also is an enemy of Horus. <laughs> what are you talking about? That is not what the original documents say, but that's what all the secret societies believe now. That's the story that they're told. And of course, Horus now replaces Jesus Christ. Sat actually becomes the God of the Old Testament, the Tetragrammaton, YHVH. And now there's a war within the kingdom and the mother, who's the Holy Spirit, who's never even mentioned, now becomes Lucifer, cast down and laying down there, I guess, with Satan. And all of these are the nefarious creatures. <laughs> oh my goodness. Should we keep going on? Well, we can. So as we keep going, if you turn on Netflix right now and you type in Lucifer, what comes on is now a rather dashing European man that looks like he should be on GQ magazine is now Venus or Lucifer. He's, he's got wings. He's the devil character, and, but he's good sometimes. He's confused if he wants to be good or bad. And this is now Venus. And so inside of most people's mind, as it keeps morphing, as the mainframe continues to change and the Mandela effects continue to happen, in most people's mind, Lucifer is actually an angel, a dark angel with, that destroys things, and that is Satan. But what's really happening, let me show you what's really happening, is now I, I crack five for you. That's one key. You know, Venus is really the mother. She's five. Perfect five. Okay? She can birth continuously, and you would never even know you were looking at the same thing. Five does that. It is a number that keeps creating more and more and more and more, but they're never the same number. That's exactly what we're looking at in reality, where no leaf is the same. Okay? So that's five. Now you have six. Now to turn this upside down only takes to turn the symbol upside down, by the way. Just so you know, to, to take a force of creation and turn it into a force of destruction is only to turn it upside down. And this is why still now, 10 minutes? Well, we, we can do it. We can, we can say something. <laughs> do we have some, something to say here? Are we running out of time? No, you said when you turn, um, turn that around, were you talking about six? No, I'm talking about when you turn a five or a pentagram upside uh, down, okay. mm -hmm. right? So it appears like something, right? So this is why you can always see this kind of symbolism in what they call dark magic. As you see this upside down pentagram seem to be connected with dark magic because it's a simple reference. Really, it's the straight line that is the disrespect to Venus because Venus is not a straight line. She holds a curve. Everything that's organic holds a curve. It's like a concave thing like you would do with a with the spiral graph. It's using a spiral force, okay? So the straight line is really the lie, not necessarily to turn it upside down because to turn it upside down is actually the positioning of how you're looking at it in the sky. Venus is a compass. So just like in masonry, let me show you just how diabolical it gets. In masonry, you see in the symbol, you see a square and you see a compass and then you see a G. What this is a reference to is earth, measuring, measuring the earth and measuring the stars 
And once you have that knowledge of how to measure the earth and how to measure the stars, you'll see how they're connected. Oh, shit, you're coming to this enlightenment that even the movement of the stars are somehow connected to the movement of earth. And this becomes your learning, your teaching. So that's what that symbol means. And it was used by the nobles early in a certain period of time. Now it's used by those who usurped the kingdom. Those who are using all the symbolism and profaning the symbolism, they're turning the symbols upside down. That's all that needs to happen here. So instead of this being a voluptuous woman, a voluptuous woman symbolizing fertility, it's now a frail, skinny man with his jaw sucked in, not knowing what he's going to do, arguing in a business world, okay? And that's how you turn people's symbols up down. This is mo the most sacred symbol is what I'm saying. So if somebody can do this to your most sacred symbol, which will affect your consciousness, and you don't even know that that's actually what's being done, maybe you should actually start looking over everything or just put it all away from you and start over again. And this is how you actually start raising your vibration. That's how I raise my vibration. Once I started finding this stuff out, I had a guide in my conscious that was explaining this to me through the language. It was irrefutable. I could see things three times, four times over on how they connected. So it was more difficult for me to keep believing in the lies that I was told than to accept these truths. But it was a long time. It took a long time. There is a great work being done to keep us confused. This shit is pretty much obvious. Excuse my language. So here we go. Six or sex. Okay. Now six is a funny thing because right away we find that there is this thing about sex. Okay. Where it's supposed to be the worst thing, but in a regular reality, we need it not only to survive, it's also extremely abused now fact because we're using sex for the lower forces it's actually become our harbinger our nemesis we're starting to create so many children off balance that are even going into wombs that they don't belong into because even the ancient mothers are no longer guiding the paths of who should be marrying who so we understand how water should not get with fire because it's going to work in the beginning but it's going to fizz out later on which would be called arranged marriage now because we've taken it off the system because we know so much more better now it's all screwed up and we're having a hard time even seeing what its original state was so it takes originals to come in and unlock that original aspect of themselves to reveal what is the original state so six is a reference to sex all you have to do in the kabbalah that would just be sx there would be no vowel okay so this is how we can find every single word that is related to sex or population we just need to take the two word letters S and X and put a vowel in between. So sex with the E. Sax is connected in there somehow. That's probably why they call themselves Sax Coburg Gotha. And the original people in Germany were Saxons. Okay? So all of this, actually, sax, sax was always depicted in a certain motif, in a certain style, even as an old man that was bearded, meaning that he had crossed over through every part of time. He had become a black man and a white man in the whole curve of time. So he walked through time, Father Time, who was also seen sometime as the progeny, or that he created Cain, who was the wanderer. So it just means that time is a lonely space and a lonely being that continues to go out and continues to learn and continues to know and continues to be aware of all things and is wisdom in itself. And this creates the generation. This is why when you see the planet Saturn, you see the hexagon on the pole, it's because that this is a gener it's a generator. That's why even in modern electronics, when we create things that are supposed to have a good communicative and a generative component, we always use a hexagonal grid, not just because we're Satanists, but because this is the most proficient shape to design in that is gonna bring about those results. There's real meters there, like an oscilloscope that will show you if we build this like an octagon versus a hexagram, the octagon is not gonna conduct into the bandwidth the same that the hexagram does so this stuff is not based on our personal feelings for the day and some weird dogma that we've been taught but actual real mechanics to how beings are created and how worlds are created and how consciousness is projected so now we're sitting in front of six which is two interlacing triangles seeming to hint that one of these triangles must be masculine and the other one must be feminine and when they come together something comes forth from in between like the, so in the center of the hexagram and the pentagram, also known as the tetrahedron, when you do it three-dimensionally, in the center comes life. So life is birthed from this symbol, okay? And so now in all these deep teachings from Nassim Harriman and all the rest of the people who jumped onto the tetrahedron group, 
they will testify to this shape being not only capable of doing this on multiple levels, but also doing it in machines and all sorts of things. There's a couple things that they miss, like that this symbol actually is really the ohm. The actual ohm or torus field, this is what this is. It's not really just this straight line star that looks like a sheriff badge or, uh, is on, or the Israeli flag but actually something that is curved in several yantras, which we call the machine. Yantra means machine. So several yantras of a cornucopic field that actually is used as a portal to bring forth life, okay? And take life away, right? That's why they tell you, yeah, you spin it this direction, it does this thing, you spin it that direction, it does this. So right away, right away we're talking about two very large forms of power and all of what magic could ever be ever made out of anyway is something like what you would see venus consist of with its ability to be able to actually bring things into physicality and then this triantric force known as six or brahm who also which is uh, brahm and saraswati put together that is also able to continuously birth another form of life or intelligence and so now we see why in the Washington streets you have encoded the pentagram and the hexagram not only faced upside down, which is based on how they're pointing on the compass, but also straight lines because it's literally saying we are defacing the ancient Venus and Saturn connection, the thing that created and birthed much of the life forms here, and we are bringing in this new artificial straight line version where Satan now becomes a horned Baphomet creature that seems to be quite confused. And Venus, as I said, becomes some male that is skinny and actually is looking for some chicks. And somehow it's playing out in everybody's mind that that's not going to affect things. So this is where we have to start stepping up into our guardianship because that is the reason why we're disconnected. That is the reason why we have no guides, and I'm speaking collectively here. Having no guide means if you alienate yourself from your mother, well, she's always going to try to help you, and she's always doing it. She's feeding you still. You're eating from her. But father, he's a bit more stern. Like He requires that you actually understand the order, and that's why the tetrahedron was always connected into the fields of Orion. And high father, the lions, as they call them, and this is the Leo Fentalis, the lion-like beings of Orion, the lion-faced gods of Kemet and all this kind of stuff that they're referring to is they're just referring to, just as we see lions in the world today as being the king of the beast, if you may, that this constellation played a heavy role in the governance of what was to happen throughout empires and throughout the, the cycles of nature and life. And the only thing that they've been able to pull off here in the film, and this is why some people say, well, why is this all happening on earth? Why doesn't High Father just come with the angels? Or why doesn't the mother come with her ships in the reptilian fifth column army? Or what the hell, what's happening? Well, first of all, it's because it's inside of you and it's for you to keep it in balance and then awake that within yourself. But most importantly, it is because of what I told you earlier about projections. See, because what Hollywood was able to do is to create a space where the order cannot see this. That was their great work, to create a space where order cannot find this so that there would be disorder. See, because there is beings, just like you like to heal people, there are beings that they're just looking and scouring the projections to find ones that are out of balance so they can bring balance to it. Looking for something out of place. So that was always, in fact, that's the garden, the garden, the guardians, okay? There's only one command. Although we're all unique, we have one command, guard. 